Well, I'm delighted to make the next introduction. I'm delighted to make all of them. This one gives me special pleasure. Uh, when people learn that I'm friends with Adam Savage, they almost always ask the same question. They say, please tell me he's as nice in person as he is on the show. And I always say, no. <laughs> he's, he's actually nicer. I mean, soon after uh, I announced my congressional run last year, I got an email from Adam demanding to know why I hadn't already asked him for a donation and asking what he could do to help. Last year, he stood for hours autographing ping pong balls uh, from the uh, Mythbusters episode and had a smile and a warm greeting for everyone in the audience. Being the nicest guy on the planet would be uh, enough for most people, but not for Adam. Uh, his resume is remarkable. His phenomenal special effects skills have been seen in recent Star Wars movies and uh, Matrix films. And frankly, one of my favorites, Galaxy Quest, which contains the great line, why is there one of these on all these ships? I love that movie. And some really cool commercials. But all these things, I think, pale in comparison to his national television work. And I'm not even talking about the Mythbusters, which suddenly I can't say. Uh, which is the greatest skeptical and critical thinking show of our generation. No, no. I'm talking about playing the stock boy in a Charmin ad and having Mr. Whipple squeeze his Charmin. And also, as you saw from the, uh, from the uh, uh, program, playing the drowning boy in a Billy Joel video. I'm glad he made it with us. Adam did have one request of you that he asked that I mention. Uh, he said he worries that not enough people tell him all the little tiny technical things that they think the Mythbusters got wrong. <laughs> so he said he'd really appreciate it if you could all come up in detail, in excruciating detail, tell him. Also, he'd like your own theories as to how they could have done it better. <laughs> Adam Savage is a gifted artist and a rabid tweeter indeed. Between us, we average 35,000 followers. <laughs> he has 70,000. <laughs> Hal bid. It's not that hard, people. As I mentioned, Adam is the nicest guy on the planet. I'm so honored to know him. The Jeriff is so grateful that he's here today. Ladies and gentlemen, our favorite Mythbuster, please welcome the inimitable, the amazing Adam Savage. Thank you. I'm glad to know that I've uh, replaced Phil Plate as the nicest guy on the planet. I, I, there, was a, there was a contest, and now, Phil, it's me. Um, I love coming to TAM. Uh, I always forget to do this when I do talks, which is to thank the people that brought me here. And Randy, you're one of my heroes, and it's my honor to come here every year. I'll keep coming until you guys lock the door on me. Uh, Phil. Everybody, Jamie, Ian Swiss, I've made some dear friends here over the years. I have tons of amazing memories, and you, you guys are my people. How many of you have yelled at me at the television while watching this show? <laughs> See? We're having a conversation that way. But actually, my, what I want to talk about bears directly upon my introduction, which is uh, my resume. People give an introduction, then they give my resume. And because I've enjoyed a certain amount of success in my life, it's easy to perceive me up here on television, on stage, as having a fairly linear path towards my success. Um, and nothing could be farther than the truth. I know that also we are inundated with, with successful people telling us that, oh, well, they failed more than they succeeded. In fact, there's a great, one of the greatest shows ever made for television was uh, 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 Aaron Sorkin's first show, Sports Night. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't, you can buy both seasons on DVD, and it's like the best 51 hour, no, sorry, that's half hour episodes, 26 hours of television watching you could get. And uh, at the end of the second season, uh, Dana, the main character, meets uh, a, a guy who's going to buy her television show. He's going to buy the, the sports night show. And he, he has a company called Quo Vadimus, which I think is Latin for where are we going? Am I correct about that? Okay. And he says to her, He's a, he's a billionaire, he's de developed some software thing, and he says, I've failed far more than I've succeeded, but the question I'm always asking is, quo vadimus, where are we going? That's what I say to my people. And I notice that 
successful people are always saying something like that, but they're not, they're not telling you how it works. They're not telling you, they're telling you that they failed in the abstract, but I think the concrete example is an important one. I mean, when I say that I've failed, my first job as a PA, I was given the keys to a truck, and then I got into another truck with the guy who was driving, and I drove two hours to a location. So the first truck stayed where I was formerly for four hours while they came and found me and got the keys and then fired me. <laughs> um, I've caused car accidents. I've yelled at my kids and scared them. I've been divorced. So I know failure. I really have, I have been there. And I want to tell you about within the one step forward, two steps back, that all of our lives encompass, that there is no exception here. In uh, 1999, I took a job at uh, Industrial Light and Magic and started working for Lucasfilm, which was something I had wanted since I was 11 years old. And it was very much, very much everything that I had hoped it would be. Um, I was working with heroes of mine, people that had been reading special effects magazines in the late 70s, uh, and I was finding that I had things to give to them. I had information that they wanted, and I was collaborating on the scale on ships and things that I'd always dreamed that I would be making. And I noticed there was this actually this other ancillary benefit to working for a place that was as well known as Industrial Light and Magic, which was that, um, well, I should point out that in the special effects industry, there aren't really any jobs. There are, there are jobs for periods of time. So you're effectively freelance. And when you're freelance, every freelancer knows your brain is constantly thinking, what's next? What am I going to do next? Where is the next month's rent coming from? And so you are always, while working on jobs, chasing down other jobs, networking, talking to people, spending a lot of time trying to line up the things that are going to pay your rent two months later. The nice thing was, is that once you got work at Industrial Light and Magic, people only need to, needed to hear that, and you didn't need to sell yourself anymore. They just figured, if you worked at Industrial Light and Magic, you are now one of those wizards, and you could build what they needed. And all of a sudden, my resume was just three words. Four words. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I started getting some l wonderful jobs. And in addition to working at Industrial Light Magic, I had these, I, which was a nice bump in my income. I also got these extra side jobs. So I was doing quite well. And uh, my friend Ben called me up and said, Look, I've got this job coming up and I've had to turn it down. In fact, everyone in town has turned this job down because it's, the timeline is too short. But I think you might have the time and the inclination to do it. And I, I said, when do they want it? He was calling me on a Monday. And the job needed to be installed in the windows of a large department store in San Francisco on a Saturday morning. It was a five-day turnaround. And what they wanted was the new San Francisco ballpark was opening up. And they wanted to do these uh, commemorative ballpark windows in this where uh, they had a fence, a ballpark fence, and ball players, but they wanted baseballs to be pitching themselves over the fence in three separate locations for six weeks. And I thought, well, that seems pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, I got some pitching machines and some kind of reciprocating device for catching them on the other side of the wall and feeding them back to, the, back to my pitching machines. It shouldn't be that difficult. And I went and met with them. And, you know, when you're freelance also, you, you, bid, your, you bid your day rate. I mean, if there's, nothing, if there's nothing on your schedule and they have a reasonable amount of time, you bid your day rate, you know, $300, $500 a day or whatever you, you know, think you can charge. Um, but then there's also what the market will bear. And when a major department store needs uh, something built for their windows in five days, you know, you charge the rush fee. And when I looked at the rush fee, it wasn't quite big enough. I mean, I was looking at the, you don't want to leave money. You, the last thing you want to hear when you bid a job is, okay. <laughs> you, want to, you want to see this. Okay. That means you bid 10% over what they were hoping to spend, but it's not too much that the job goes away. And that's exactly what I bid on this job. And it was a really fat paycheck for five days of work. The most money I'd ever made on a day rate for that amount of work. And I figured, I've got the time, my shop is all set up, Home Depot's open 24 hours a day, I ought to be able to make this happen. And I started in on this thing. I went and got some pitching machines, I went to Granger and I bought these beautiful little uh, relay timers that would allow these, allow these foam baseballs that I was testing to, to find their way back into some kind of reciprocating uh, ball feeder, pause for a second, kick them into the pitching machine, knock them over the fence. And I built, a little, uh, uh, I built a little sample in my shop, and it worked beautifully. Like, 
about 70 times in a row. And then one of the balls went a place I could not expect at all. I mean, it literally was like over the fence, over the fence, over the fence, over the fence, and then <laughs> off to the left. And I was like, okay, that seems like it's probably a solvable problem. I'm going to continue. Now, when you're working on stuff, there are problems you can see coming, and then there are problems that you... Well, actually, this is, this is a, the, one of the great questions I've ever gotten was, if you're working on Mythbusters, and you're working on something you don't know how it works, like, you know, we're doing swimming in syrup, and I don't know anything about viscosity, and so I've got to call the National Institute of Tribology and talk to a viscosity specialist. So how do you, how, how do you start to perceive when you don't know anything? And, you know, it's, it's this process. You, you start to tackle the problems one by one, and, you know, each one sort of illuminates something else next to it. And I figured this problem of the ball going off to the left was a solvable problem, and I could continue. Um, and as we were going, I should point out also that my, my sons, who are now 10 years old, they were like six and a half months old at that point. Um, so I was kind of working out of the home. My wife was wrangling the kids. Um, and the mechanical problems with this job, getting all these things lined up, three separate pitching machines, three separate reciprocation systems, foam backing to let the balls die once they hit the wall and come on back, uh, all of this turned out to take a lot more time than I thought, and I ended up staying up all Thursday night and all Friday night and not getting any sleep from Wednesday, from Thursday morning all the way through Saturday morning at 8 a.m. when I brought all of my equipment to, to, to the department store to try and install it. This is a department store also, by the way, that searches your bags both entering and exiting no matter what kind of employee you are, so it feels great to work there. Um, <laughs> And I started installing the pitching machine. And when I got there, I discovered that a couple of uh, small changes had been made that I really ought to have been told about. One was that the stage that the ballpark set was on, which I was told would be 10 inches high, was now 7 inches high. And because I had to reciprocate a 3.5 inch diameter ball across 6 feet under that stage, it made the travel much, much slower. I also discovered, you know those, those uh, machines where the balls... The, the mechanical machines in the airports where the balls go on their little journey on the Ferris wheels and they go down the wire rails. I discovered on that job why you use wire rails and not tubes to feed spheres. It is because a sphere on a rail will just go in one direction, but a sphere in a tube can start to build up this oscillation and then it, it wants to take whatever amount of time it feels like to get down that to get down that pipe. And because I had to lower that pipe, that journey became much longer and much more unpredictable. Also, the fence got higher and the windows became narrower. So every permutation of this became more difficult to try and hit my target. And instead of 70 balls in a row, I was getting 30, 40 balls in a row. And I started doing the calculation and I was thinking, if I've got three pitching machines and they're pitching a ball about every five seconds, that means it's gonna, the whole machine's gonna empty itself out and fail about every three hours. Holy crap, I'm screwed. And I, started asking for help from the other guy installing and we started doing all these other solutions like adding air blowing down one of the reciprocating tubes to blow the balls down. Then there turned out to be this new problem which was I have never hooked up all three machines at once and I discovered this new problem which is as soon as a pitching machine kicks one of the balls out, well the motor goes under a little bit of stress because it's got to push past to kick that ball. The moment that motor goes under a little stress it draws a little more power. That little draw of power makes the other two pitching machines suddenly turn slower. And it means that their balls start to miss. Now all of a sudden this thing's becoming really pear-shaped. And I've been up for like 60 hours. Did I mention my mom and my sister were flying into town <laughs> that, that Saturday? I was supposed to be done by one or two. That was what I was thinking. And they were arriving at three. So my wife had to pack the kids in the car because I was at the department store and go to the airport and pick them up and endure the mother-in-law who you know, I love my mom and she's my biggest fan and she idolizes me to a point that's, that's lovely and also sometimes exhausting. And she's there saying, it's so hard, Adam has to work so hard. Meanwhile, my wife's over there wrangling six-month-old twins. Um, so at the end of the day, it's about six o'clock on that Saturday and the client comes up and says, how's the job going? And I said, it's not working. And she said, what? It was the last thing she expected. I mean, it's going okay. It might take me a little longer. I had to admit that 
this thing, it's not, I wasn't going to be able to make this work with any amount of effort at this point. And I had been thinking about this conversation in my head. And I had been thinking, well, I came up with this. She said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I'm going to present to you in about half an hour, I'm going to present to you three plans. You can choose one of them, and I will implement it by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And she said, okay, that's fair. I still wanted to make this money. I didn't want to give this money back. This was, this was like my new laptop. I wanted, I, I really, really, this was, and I, you know, I was thinking about the fact that the whole time I was thinking, I can do this. I work at Industrial Light and Magic, man. I'm one of those wizards. I ought to be able to do it. So I come back to her half an hour later with this plan of, 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 of guarantee that the balls will make it over the fence. I'll make three reciprocating wheels with a monofilament that goes, and I'll string and knot the ball onto the monofilament. So there they go, up and over the fence, each one, like a little, like a little chain. And she's like, okay, that sounds fine. I, I should mention this, this woman who was my client was actually like 23 with an ability to spend like tens of thousands of dollars on things like this with very little oversight, which she sh probably should have had. I'm not blaming her. I'm just saying it was funny to work for a client who was uh, 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 this inexperienced. Um, not funny for me then, funny now. <laughs> so I, 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 she bought off on the, on the chain idea, and I went home. And again, I stayed up all night that night as well. Uh, I didn't have dinner with my mom and my sister. I went to Home Depot. I went to Home Depot at uh, 8 p.m. I went to Home Depot again at, you know how Home Depot opens 24 hours until they shut down enough local hardware stores and then they go back to normal banker's hours? So this was, they were still in the 24-hour mode in San Francisco. I was there at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. buying all the materials I needed and I finished them all. I arrived on site at 8 a.m. the next morning and I spent the next five hours installing this system, three chains, 10 baseballs, monofilament, all of it stretched, all of it working, when the national head of display came and visited the set and took a look at everything and said, it looks great, those ball things, they're out, get them out, I don't like them. <laughs> um, another story. <laughs> You'll notice a trend. Uh, in 1985-86, I pretended to attend NYU uh, for a year. Um, I didn't really go to class. I got a job at the 8th Street Playhouse where the Rocky Horror Picture Show fad began and as a projectionist. Uh, and I fell in with a group of friends who are still some of my best friends in the whole world. And because most of them were going to NYU film school, I spent the next three or four years after dropping out of NYU getting an Arizat's NYU film school education by working on all their films. And the first and biggest one that I worked on was my friend David's senior thesis film called Gargoyle and Goblin, a, a super ambitious fantasy film taking place in Times Square, helped by the fact that David's grandmother, Grandma Chelly, owned all the male porn theaters in Midtown. <laughs> and we had a whole block of empty buildings, each with its own power distribution, because we kept on blowing them out. <laughs> Um, to shoot in empty rooms, empty buildings, Fanny, the, we shot in the building, that, the, the theater that Fanny Bryce's husband built for her, which was at the point we were filming it, the Adonis Theater. Um, and David uh, asked me to art direct it, and I wasn't qualified to do something like that, but if I say so myself, along with the uh, help of some amazing people, uh, some of them have gone on to be really, really big in, in uh, 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 production design in Hollywood. We, we knocked that movie out of the park. It won the NYU Film Festival Best Art Direction that year. It was absolutely gorgeous. We had a tremendous amount of fun. And for a student film, I mean, we shot 16 nights in a row in Midtown Manhattan, uh, sleeping on site in one of the buildings in this dormitory that we, that we made up. I mean, was the camaraderie, that early camaraderie of doing a, doing a project like that and busting your ass and killing yourself and succeeding at it was really thrilling. And I felt like this is something that I could do. I dropped out of NYU. I thought I wanted to be an actor. I wasn't so sure at this point. Maybe I wanted to be a filmmaker. Art direction, it really seemed like it suited me. I'd been making things all my life. I had been using my skills. This might be it. And so I, 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 I started putting my, my, my name out there. You know, I could art direct your film. And my friend Gabrielle uh, asked me, she was a film student who was producing her first student film, uh, and asked me if I would art direct it. Now, I, 
Gabby was a really, really close friend of mine within this close-knit group of about 10 or 14 friends. Um, Gabby and I were extremely close. And she asked me to do this, and I said, yeah, absolutely. This is great. She said, the director has uh, saved up money working at 7-Eleven all summer long. He's got an $850 budget for the art direction. And I thought, that's shitloads of money. That's plenty. And uh, the, the, the subject of his film was an a, 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 a ATM that talks back. I, you know, I, I did a version of this talk at Make It Fair, and I kept on saying ATM machine. And it's the only emails I got from people about the talk were, don't say ATM machine. It's an ATM that talks back at its balding owner and makes fun of his toupee. So, so they needed, a, they needed a, 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 you know, one of those rooms where the ATM is, the, the glass doors and the enclosed room. They needed control over this room. They needed, to, they needed basically to build it. And I said that I could do that. I figured... I saw them build flats in high school when we did the high school plays. I mean, how hard is that? It's just like a frame of wood. You stretch some canvas over it and you paint it. It's that. Yeah, I could do that. And the clear doors, well, we just buy some sheets of plexiglass and we paint the wood silver to look like metal. That should be fine. And the, 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 the ATM, well, they had a guy who did computer programming and some graphic work. And uh, I, all I had to do was just build a, a, a screen that he could put his monitor up behind. This is going to be a cinch. Uh, the house we found to do this in was out in Brooklyn, way out in Brooklyn. Like, you had to take the subway all the way out and then walk like 11 blocks. So I spent weeks kind of going to the hardware store and carrying like 10 foot long pieces of wood on the subway, no small feet, uh, and then out to the set in Brooklyn where uh, we built this, I built this. In both of these jobs, you'll notice I never asked anyone for any help. Um, I built this, this set. I, I, I stuck those linoleum stick-on tiles to his carpeted floor, which, you know, when I did the first test, seemed just fine. You know, I put it down, pulled it up, it wasn't sticky. It's fine. I, uh, I made all the flats. They said they had some guys who could help me, and I said, well, th those guys can paint the flats. Um, and then I went back and started making the ATM machine. And the details are pretty similar to the first story, which is that Round about Wednesday afternoon, I realized that the shoot was starting on Saturday morning and I wasn't anywhere close to ready. Uh, and I, I, I didn't sleep for about 60 hours straight, getting everything ready, running to hardware stores and working on things. And things started to go really, really wrong. Like the screen I had that went in front of their, their ATM display cracked, but I thought, oh, it's the urban environment. They'll be fine with that. I'll just tell them it's part of the art direction. Uh, and. <laughs> It didn't go over so well. <laughs> um, so Saturday morning comes. I go out on set to discover that the flats that they painted for me, I didn't know this in theater, you have to pre-prep the canvas with this stuff. If you just paint it, it can wrinkle and go all over the place. And that's what this ATM machine looked like, a, like a worn out shirt. This, <laughs> this room was wrinkled and the wrinkles were going in every direction and the crew showed up and was like immediately pissed off. And I'm just figuring, I'm going to, I can make this work. I did Gargoyle and Goblin, man. I can run around. I'm running around taking care of things, taking care of things. And everywhere I'm taking care of something, someone's like, hey, what about this? And I'm like, oh, I'll take care of that. And I'm ready. Well, wait, hold on. I'll take care of that. And at a certain point, one of the crew said, do you know what you're doing? Do you even know what you're doing? And I thought, <laughs> This shows how I still thought of myself in that moment. Like, I was going to be the hero of this movie. So I thought, well, maybe a line from Raiders of the Lost Ark would apply here. So I said, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. And it was lost on him. <laughs> he put his hand on my shoulder and said, go home. And that's when I felt like things had really now I had, now it was bad. Now it was really bad. And I went home. I went home on Saturday. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure I actually went home. I think, you know, in New York, you don't have to go home if you don't want to. You can just go to a friend's house and go hang out and go eat and stay up all night and do what you will. And Monday morning rolled around. I knew they were done with the shoot. And I went to the set to pick up my, to pick up my toolbox. 
and my toolbox wasn't there. But it's very specific that li there literally was like a taped area on the ground where my toolbox had been with a note that said, we have your toolbox, call me, Gabby. And I picked up the phone and I called Gabby and Gabby said, what did you do to me? I trusted you. You screwed us. Do you know that we pulled two all-nighters in a row to make this film work? Do you know that he worked, the director worked all summer long saving up the money that you pissed away on his set? She said, if you could have done anything to convince me that you were not worthy to be friends with, you've done it. And she said, come, come here, come, come, come to my room, come to my, come to my apartment. I need to go over every goddamn cent of this budget because we didn't see it. We didn't see it in the, in the set. I want you to account for every penny you spent. And I hung up the phone and I just started crying. I called my dad and like every other time I've turned to my, I had turned to my dad, I don't remember anything my dad said very specifically. I remember him being very clear that all I could do was move forward from this moment. I remember him saying something to that effect, saying, you know, you have to take that you've screwed up and you've got to go talk to them. Um, that's all you can do. And I went and saw Gabby, and somehow, I don't know how this works, what kind of bistro mathics was involved, but every penny was accounted for in my receipt list, somehow. And it took us about two hours to go through this with my very clearly ex-friend. And then we finished and Gabby said, the crew is next door and they want to talk to you. Now I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is going to be like a scene from Animal House. Remember where uh, the guy opens the door and he thinks he's on a date and the girl's boyfriend kicks the shit out of him? <laughs> and that's what I want to happen. I feel so crappy at this moment that I want someone to beat me up. That will feel like a release. That will feel like I've gotten what I deserve. Um, <sighs> I really felt like that. And I opened the door, and I'm not exaggerating at all. What I opened the door onto was a dark dorm room with the entire crew of this film surround free, a chair in the middle, and a spotlight on the chair. <laughs> at moment, I thought, well, now it makes a good story, at least. Because no one's going to believe that they did this. So knowing my place, I went and sat dutifully in the chair, and the director pulled out this pad of paper and just started reading all the things that I said I would do in the course of the two months that we were working on this film, all the things that I said I would do that I didn't do. And he didn't miss a trick. I mean, he really had it all down. It was an am I had never made a list of this complete, but man, he had every last item. And as he was going through it occasionally, as he was going through it occasionally, the crew would pipe in with, ah, oh, yeah, man, that really pissed me off. <laughs> it's like the Greek chorus. To add insult to injury, actually, I want to point out that on Sunday night, when they had already pulled two all-nighters making this movie, and they were loading out to find, of course, that I had ruined the carpet in this apartment with my self-stick tiles, I was all the way across town having sex. <laughs> and they found out about it. They, they were honorable enough not to mention that, but I knew that they knew, and they knew I knew they knew. <laughs> and the, uh, the director said, so what do you have to say? And I said, what can, what can I say? You guys didn't, you didn't miss a thing. You're absolutely right. I, I, I screwed this up from start to finish. I, I can't describe to you how awful I feel, how low I feel, how sorry I am. I also understand how totally meaningless my, my, my feelings are in this moment and how meaningless my apology is. And I'm also sorry for that. I'm sorry on like four meta levels of sorry, I'm that sorry. And I know that that doesn't mean anything either. Um, I, I know this is a story about my personal failure, but I do want to point out that after I said that, there was this long pause and the director said, I'm not joking, he said, because I think, what, I just so I want to say, I think they wanted to fight. They wanted me to go, no, man, I meant to do that. And they go, yo, you didn't. They wanted, they wanted someone to argue with. And I wasn't giving them that. 
Because, you know, my father was manic depressive. I know how not to argue with someone that's mad at me. I know how to please the room. I was, I was the reed that bends. And so there was this long pause after my four meta apologies and the director said, look, we're not trying to bring you down or anything. I, I had a therapist years later who pointed out, she was like, do you realize what shitty reinforcement that was for you? How successful your ability to deflect their anger was? So this is a terrible reinforcement of your abilities that you should not be using. So, uh, there's a quote in the beginning of Ian McEwan's Enduring Love that sticks with me. And I meant to look it up, I forgot to look it up. I'm going to try and paraphrase it, but the, 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 the analogy really works for me. He says at one point, in describing the opening of this book is him and five people, four people in a public park watching a balloon accident, and they're running towards this balloon accident. And he describes it in a really, it's an amazing first chapter. And he describes it that there was just a moment when they heard a sound and a moment when they were running. There was no decision made. They just were running. And he saw these people coalescing from the different corners of the space. And he says, we were running towards a kind of catastrophe in whose furnace our lives and our characters would be buckled into new shapes. And that's what I have realized over my life has happened in those moments. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do when you, when, you, when you screw something up badly. A lot of people deflect. A lot of people ignore. A lot of people blame. Now, I've definitely not been one of those people, and I don't trust people that don't think that they've failed. If people, you know, I've worked at risk-averse places where if you start to screw up a job, they just send you more people without telling you that you're going over budget, and everyone does, everyone feels like they do great. I don't trust working with some of those people because they don't know. Their characters haven't withstood having totally been responsible for screwing something up and recovering and moving on. It's the covatimus. Where are we going? Um, there's... <laughs> I mean, somewhere in my early 20s, I managed to figure out that I was thinking something totally different than I thought two years previously. And I just made that as a little mark in my head. Whatever you think now, you're probably wrong. <laughs> and so if I think of one, one, one quality that makes a skeptic, that makes me a skeptic at heart, it's having totally screwed up. It's failure. And I'm not talking about the failure is always an option that we joke about on the show. I mean, it's abject screwing something up, losing a friend, hurting someone you love, uh, breaking something that you care about. The other thing that's important about that, and I, get, I feel nervous when I start quoting too much from books that I love, because I feel like it's a weird sort of proselytizing, makes me feel like a preacher, but uh, Rilke has this amazing letter in Letters to a Young Poet, where he's counseling, he's counseling the young poet, and he says, um, we find our moments of sadness, again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's translated from the German, so who cares? <laughs> it's my translation. Uh, he says, we find our moments of sadness terrifying because we find ourselves standing in a place we cannot remain standing. The past has left us and the future has not taken hold. He says, wait, where is it? The future has not yet taken hold. He says, but we have changed as a house changes into which someone has entered. And he says, and this is why it's so important to be lonely and attentive. And I love that particular translation because there's nothing lonelier than taking responsibility for something you've done. He says, this is why it's important to be lonely and attentive when one is sad because that's the point at which the change in your character occurs. Later on, he explains, it'll seem to happen as if from outside. And, and he calls it the noisy and fortuitous time from outside. But he says, that's the moment right there where the switch gets turned. And that's where you've got to be attentive to it. Lastly, I want to point out that my favorite hero of all fictional heroes is Philip Marlowe from Raymond Chandler. And uh, in, in The Simple Art of Murder, Chandler describes his hero. And after giving all of his wonderful qualities, and he 
It's a beautiful essay to read, and I'd recommend if you like Chandler and you haven't read it, you read it right away, because it's quite shocking how knowledgeable Chandler was of exactly the kind of hero he was creating. He gives all of his qualities, and you, wow, you see them all in the book. You realize every scene he wrote, he was following all of, these, all of these qualities. But in the end, he says, if the world were full of people like him, it would be a very safe place to live in without being too boring to be worth living in. And that is what I have striven to be. I like I, 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 I take counsel from Chandler's hero. I take counsel from Marlowe and the number of times that Marlowe screws up. And I think about the fact that a, a person of honor takes responsibility for what they've done and they move on and that's all you can do. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. All right, we have time for just a handful of questions, if there are, comments, or again, those technical details with Mistbusters that Adam you know, wants to know about. Um, can I actually state, I would love questions about something other than Mythbusters. I will keep coming back, and you can walk up to me and talk to me about Mythbusters specifically, but, uh, well, nah, screw it. Ask me anything. I was mostly going for shtick, so... <laughs> They're all the way in the back. Talk among yourselves. <laughs> Michael, I'm drinking your water. You don't have any cooties or anything, do you? We proved double dipping is no problem last week. <laughs> We're about to test um, stall one and four of one to four of the bathroom. The the theory being that stall one is really clean because no one wants to poop next to everyone else. All righty, on your right, uh, way in the back. <laughs> Dr. Kamp, Los Angeles. Who is the German philosopher that you quoted, please? Uh, the German philosopher was Rilke. Uh, the book is Letters to a Young Poet. Uh, Rilke also... <clears throat> ah, actually, Rilke wrote another quote that is one of, one of my father's all-time favorite... One of my father's all-time favorite quotes, which was... He wrote a, an amazing monograph on, uh, on Rodin. And uh, for the record, Rodin couldn't stand Rilke. He hated this tubercular little shrew that was following him around for several weeks. But um, the opening line of his monograph on uh, uh, Rodin is amazing. He said, he's, it, begins with an, it begins with a man. It begins with a name. Um, it is a famous name. But what is fame but the sum of all the misunderstandings that surround a name? On the right, all the way in the back. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, sorry, this is a Mythbusters question, Go so right I apologize ahead. in advance. No. Uh, I'm Steve from Connecticut. Uh, I've noticed some of the experiments you've done, a few of them have actually been really quite good in terms of the data you returned. And I'm wondering, have you ever considered whether or not you might be able to actually do a Mythbusters experiment that would qualify for publication in a journal? I have. Um, yeah, most of, them don't, most of them don't fall into that category with their data sets of one and two. <laughs> it's, Jamie is always wanting to finish the episode going, well, who knows? <laughs> and we have to point out, it's television, man. We so, have to come to a conclusion based upon the data we've collected. He's like, but I don't agree with the data we've collected. I'm like, you still got to come to a conclusion. If you piss somebody off, that's fine. We'll come back and redo it. But, you know, we've got to engage, we've got to engage with the material like this. Um, the, there is one episode in which I consider our results to be totally unassailable, and it's bullets fired up. The myth was, if bullets are fired straight up into the air, will they kill you when they come back down? And <clears throat> the military actually wanted to know this. Uh, and their, their desire to know this is written about in a famous book on ballistics called Hatcher's Notebook, which I'm sure that some of you are familiar with. Uh, the military wanted to know in the 20s, could they advance towards a town that they were, let's say, a half mile away from and just let a raining hail of bullets fall on that town and take care of a certain number of the enemy? And so they sent some researchers out to this lake on the theory that if they fired bullets in the air, they'd be able to hear them hit the water. And they spent several days in this protected shed on the middle of the lake, shooting 500 rounds into the air. 
and I think they found one embedded into the roof and heard two in the water. Um, enough to conclude that it was not a reliable way to harm your enemy from a safe distance with inexpensive munitions. Um, we went out to the desert with a methodology that I'm really proud of. Uh, we set eight lean-tos of, of bullet-resistant glass in a, a circle at eight cardinal points with a person under each one facing outwards. We had a handgun, a nine millimeter handgun in the middle. We chose a round that was fairly slow that would only go to about a half a mile. And rapid fire, we also had the math about how long it would roughly take those bullets to come back and hit the ground, about a minute. And we fired 11 rounds at a very steady pace. Bang, 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 bang. I hope that was 11. And then I counted off five second intervals until one minute and then I was quiet. And it worked exactly as we'd hoped. Uh, the people facing out from the, radiating, radiating out from the circle heard the bullets hit the ground, even about 200 feet away. <clears throat> More than that, some of them heard it clearer than others, so we actually had a kind of rudimentary triangulation. And out of the 11 rounds we fired, we found six. Uh, more than that, those six rounds went exactly as deep into the lake bed as the bullets we dropped from 400 feet from a hot air balloon, from a helium balloon, which was the height required for them to hit terminal velocity. So we knew that the bullets were going the same, the same speed when they hit the ground. They also made bullet-shaped holes in the ground, telling us that our wind tunnel tests in the shop were correct, that a bullet's most stable falling position is on its side. And thus, its speed is equivalent to everything that we tested in the shop. And I think those results are totally publishable. It turns out that if you're able to fire exactly vertically, that bullet is not going to kill you. It's just going to piss you off. However, <laughs> if you are two or three degrees off, that bullet will stay on a ballistic trajectory and come down much faster and go right through you when it hits the ground. Um, that episode is actually, I think, one that I'm more proud of than any other, specifically in terms of the science. Hey, Adam, I'm Terry from Atlanta. Um, I just have a comment about, kind of related to what you said. Uh, it, I am an editorial assistant for a peer-reviewed journal called Teaching of Psychology, and uh, it's probably pretty self-evident from the title what the focus is. There's a couple of psychology professors in South Carolina who are using your uh, television show as a teaching tool in their introductory research methods classes, and they've had control groups to see you know, how enriching of a tool it really is. They submitted their manuscript last year. It was recently accepted for publication. So come this time next year, it should be officially in print. Mythbusters will be uh, enter, enter the scientific literature as a scientifically verified teaching tool for um, critical thinking skills and research methods. So congratulations on that count. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for telling me. That's awesome. All you real science teachers, I know that often we're just giving you talking points because we screwed something up. We're aware of that. <laughs> On your left. Hi, Adam. Nathan from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. In the unlikely event of an apocalypse, which of your handmade creations could you possibly not do without? <laughs> yeah, no, they, they would all go. What would I want? I'd want the Leatherman on my belt, the uh, flashlight in my pocket. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not that attached to objects that I'd want to grab them out of a burning fire. I'd go for my kids first. <laughs> and the Maltese Falcon, by the way, is heavy. This will be our last question. Michael Sutherland from Australia. How goes your research for your ignoble submission on the categorization of usage of words for very large and small amounts? My taxonomy of nonsense words for large and small numbers. It, is, it has been sitting by the wayside. I, I talked to Chip Denman about it, uh, about setting up a website. Of course, you know, self-selected, to be sure. Um, I have not done any substantive work on it in a long time, but still, I, I'm still adding terms on occasion. Uh, it's, still, it's still a dream to win an Ig Nobel Prize. A boy can dream. Thank you, everybody, so much. See you next year.
Well, it's not an ignoble prize, but it is a sincere token of our appreciation for once again being our guest. Thank you so much. We're honored to have you here, Adam Savage. Thank you, my friend.